The location of your speakers can have a huge impact on the sound. Let me show you what I mean. Here I've got a pair of bookshelf speakers from Hi Vi Swans. And when you crack open the manual, you'll see that the manufacturer recommends that you keep the back of the speaker at least 30 centimeters away from the nearest wall. That's about a foot for those of us that use freedom units. That seemed odd to me. This is the kind of setup that you're probably going to use in a bedroom, a home office, or a dorm room. And just from a practical standpoint, that means you're probably going to place these up against a wall. So I figured why not take some measurements. And just so you know up front, Hi-Vi sent these out for me to review. And after I take a few measurements and explain the results, I will give you my honest opinion about these speakers. To take the measurements, I'm gonna be using Room Equalization Wizard along with a calibrated measurement microphone. And I'll be sure to give you a link to all of the stuff you see in the video down in the video description. I'm gonna start by placing the mic a little over three feet from the speaker and then placing the speaker as close to a wall as I can. The limiting factor here is the RCA cables that stick out from the back of the speaker. If you look on the back of the right speaker, you'll see that in in addition to those RCA inputs, there is an output for the left speaker and digital inputs, but most people are probably just going to use Bluetooth. You can choose between sources using this touch panel on the top of the right speaker. To power on and off, you just touch the power icon for a second or two. When you hit the source button, the display shows the different source. You can hold down or tap both the volume up and volume down buttons, and when the volume changes, the source name will actually blink. There's also a handy dandy mute button. Let's go ahead and run a sweep. After running a sweep, we see that we get a mostly flat response, except for these two regions right here, and this dip around 320, 330 hertz. The difference between these peaks and that null is about seven and a half deep. You'll also notice that at frequencies below about 150 hertz, the bass rolls off quite rapidly. This is what you should expect from a four inch driver. Now that driver looks really familiar to me as a DIYer. It's probably the B4N, which you can get at Parts Express. At the time of filming, it's on sale for about 12 bucks. I like the looks of this driver. It's got a very distinctive copper cone. It's a very distinctive style. That same driver is also used in the Overnight Sensations, a very popular DIY kit. Let's see what happens when you move the speaker a little further from the wall. I'm using some old Radio Shack speakers that I've had since I was in high school as speaker stands. They're literally speaker stands. For this test, I'm just gonna pull the OS 10 right up to the edge of that old speaker and run another sweep after moving the mic back just a little bit so I'm still three feet away. And we get a very subtle difference. The response is a bit more linear. In this context, linear just means that all of the frequencies play at about the same loudness. That big dip is now a few hertz lower and about a dB louder, while the peaks around it are about a dB lower. Why did that make any difference at all? That has to do with the way sound interacts with the baffle. The baffle, that's what you call the front of the speaker. If you were to crack open this book here, this is the loud speaker design cookbook, we can see a concept called baffle step. When sound radiates from a speaker, different frequencies behave differently. Low frequencies have very long wavelengths and these waves will wrap around the speaker. Some people like to say that low frequencies are non-directional. That's not accurate. Bass is omnidirectional. In fact, you may notice that these speakers are ported and the port is on the back. You can get away with putting a port on the back of your speakers because the sound that comes from the port is low frequencies with long wavelengths and they will wrap around to the front of the speaker. And they will sound just fine from the front. Any frequency with a wavelength that's bigger than the baffle will wrap around the baffle. Any frequency with a wavelength that's smaller than the baffle will just shoot forward. As you can see from this diagram, you end up with a gradual roll off. This diagram is for a spear shaped baffle. If you have a flat baffle, the result is a little bit more jagged. The baffle on the OS 10 is slightly curved, so your result's gonna be somewhere in between. If you mount speakers flush with the wall, you have an infinite baffle and you don't get that roll off. 
because the low frequencies can't wrap around to the back. One thing you'll notice from this plot right here is you don't get a roll off at the low frequencies. Instead, we see a little bit of a boost in frequencies below 1000 hertz. That's not exactly what we would expect. More on that in a bit. Let's try the test again. We're gonna move the back of the speaker about 18 inches from the wall and slide the microphone out a little bit further to compensate. You can see that this zone between 150 and 400 hertz has smoothed out quite a bit. The overall response in that region is a whole lot more linear, which is why you want to pull your speakers out away from the wall. Now, there are any number of things that could have caused that null when the speaker was up against the wall. It may have been caused by the reflection from the wave hitting the wall and then coming back to the microphone out of phase with the speaker. Likewise, this spike right here that we now have with the speaker away from the wall is probably being caused by reflected sound coming back at us and coming back in phase with the speaker, causing a standing wave and causing a little spike. But in any case, pulling the speaker away from the wall is gonna get you a lot better result. Let's go back to this plot and talk about the lack of a baffle step response. Instead of the gradual fall expected by our handy little baffle step theory, we get a gradual rise giving us a little bit more mid range. And other than these little peaks and valleys, a relatively flat response. That's because these powered speakers have a DSP inside, and it appears that High Vice Swans added some EQ to account for the baffle step. Here's another clue. There are four pins in the connector for the left speaker, a pair for the tweeter and a pair for the woofer. So there is some type of crossover network in that right speaker. The manual actually calls it a DSP filter. So these things have in fact been DSP'd for a flat response. You know what? These things look very similar to the High Vice Swans D1100s that I tested on my channel a few months back. That speaker appears to be using the exact same DSP and amplifier as well as the same tweeter. The difference is the D1100s have knobs instead of a touch panel and the D1100 has bass and treble controls. The D1100 uses a black cone 4 inch driver. It's probably the M4N instead of the copper B4N. Beyond that, the differences between the two speakers appear to be cosmetic. Now, personally, I prefer the look of this OS-10. The outer covering is some type of fabric, and that copper comb gives it a very distinctive look. I've had the D1100 sitting on my desk at work, and I really do enjoy the sound. To my ears, the OS-10 sound about the same. And of course, the inquiring minds want to know how does it sound. And I'd love to show you, but the wireless remote is a little bit finicky. Only real criticism of these speakers is they kind of need a subwoofer to hit those really low frequencies. But on everyday music, the type I would listen to while at work, I really don't notice the difference. The recording really just doesn't do these things justice. Overall, I feel I can easily recommend either the D1100 or the OS10 because they sound good and they are a great value. In fact, the OS10 is only a few bucks more than that DIY kit using the same driver and the kit doesn't come with an amplifier. Even though I think the OS-10 looks better than the D1100, if I had to pick one, I'd pick the D1100 because I found the touch controls on the OS-10 to be a little awkward. But that's really more a matter of personal taste. To see my review of the D1100, click right here. Before I go, I need to say thank you to my patrons, especially $25 patrons, Bo, Dylan, Fargo, JD America, Sean, David, and Baba. I'm Justin, this is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel and I will see you on the next adventure.